an equal opportunity and in fairness. That is, we have to think about how to prevent AI-enabled discrimination and how to ensure that workers are treated fairly in an AI-enabled workplace. Our speaker today is one of the most creative academic thinkers on this topic, and she's going to share the latest ideas with you. Professor Pauline Kim is the Daniel Noyes Kirby Professor of Law at the Washington University in St. Louis School of Law. She is a nationally recognized expert on the law of the workplace and has written widely on issues such as job security, employee privacy, and employment discrimination. Her current research focuses on the use of big data and artificial intelligence in the workplace and the implications of these technologies for employee privacy and anti-discrimination law. Professor Kim is the co-director of Washington University's Center for Empirical Research in the Law and is co-author of one of the leading textbooks on employment law titled Work Law, Cases and Materials, which is now in its fourth edition. Before entering law teaching, she served as a staff attorney at the Employment Law Center Legal Aid Society of San Francisco. He's also a member of the American Law Institute, one of the most prestigious honors that any law lawyer or law professor can garner. After Professor Kim speaks, there will be an opportunity for questions from the audience, and I will moderate that question and answer period. And so obviously from the people that are here in person, I can take your questions just by raising your hand. For those of you who are joining us online, um, there is a Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So simply put your questions in there. I will absorb them and will pose them uh, to Professor Kim. It's now my great pleasure to invite Professor Pauline Kim to share her ideas with you. Great, thank you so much. Um, let me just take a minute here and get my slides. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, my background is um, as a lawyer and specifically a, uh, employ a employment and uh, labor lawyer originally in practice and then I have been teaching for quite a few years um, in those areas. And really um, over the last five to ten years it has become apparent to me that issues that I have been concerned with in terms of workers rights increasingly focus on technology and so that's where my uh, scholarly focus um, has shifted. And there is no question that these developments in terms of artificial intelligence, machine learning, the use of predictive algorithms are having a tremendous impact on the workplace. So, one second. So a great deal of the popular attention surrounding AI in the workplace has focused on this, this worry about robots. Are the robots coming to take our jobs? Are, is human labor going to be displaced? There's going to be massive unemployment, social dislocation. Um, I think these are important issues, but I think they're actually a little further down the line. I think in the near to short, short term to midterm, human labor is still going to be an important part of our economy. And what's going to be changing is that workers are increasingly working with novel technological tools, and they're going to be working alongside robots rather than being wholly replaced by them in the workplace. So I want to focus on a different set of challenges that new technologies pose in the workplace. And that is how AI and predictive algorithms are being used to manage workers and the implications that that has for workplace equality. So as I will discuss, these tools can possibly have the potential for worsening workplace equality in at least two distinct ways. The first is by potentially contributing to bias and discrimination in the workplace, and the second is by increasing economic inequality. So how are these tools being used in the workplace? Um, in the uh, hiring process, employers are increasingly relying on algorithmically driven platforms like Facebook and Google to send out advertisements about job opportunities, they also rely on job matching platforms like Indeed or ZipRecruiter or Monster 
Um, and those platforms have a lot of power in terms of distributing information about jobs and opportunities are there. Uh, once an employee or an applicant applies to a job, uh, employers then often use data analytics to try to screen those workers to decide who, uh, who's going to get to the next step in the process. And ultimately, some employers use them for um, selection purposes as well, to try to identify the best possible workers. Um, and so in doing this, employers are using an awful lot of data. They take data about past applicants and maybe their current employees. They mine that data for, for information and insights and then apply it to new applicants to try to predict who's going to be a good employee. And in doing that, they're collecting a lot of information about workers. Now, some of that is information that the workers have traditionally always shared with employers, um, things like experience, education, and so on. But when they're interacting with these computer platforms, there's a lot of metadata that can be collected as well, right? What kind of browser they're using, how long it takes them to fill out particular forms, how many words they use, and so on. Um, some of these platforms are asking, are requiring, I should say, applicants to engage in video games. And this gameplay is then analyzed to make predictions about what kind of a personality they have, what kind of an employee they will be. Um, other platforms are using uh, video recorded interviews, and those videos are then analyzed, not just for the content of what the candidate says, but again, also looking at metadata, analyzing speech patterns and facial expressions to, to try to deduce something about the individual's personality or something about uh, their, you know, their character or their ability to be successful um, on the job. Um, so. Um, once hired, then, um, workers are also subject to management and supervision uh, by data, data analytics and AI. So, um, you know, one of the areas where this is happening quite a bit is in the warehouse industry. Warehouse workers are subject to close monitoring. Uh, they're, they're often required to wear sensors that track their movements uh, or they carry devices that record um, every step of the process that can keep track of how quickly they're moving and how quickly they're fulfilling orders. Um, another uh, important development has been uh, the development of computer monitoring software, and this became ever more uh, pervasive with the increase in remote work during the pandemic. Um, so all kinds of monitoring tools are available to employer to count keystrokes, uh, take ra random screenshots of what an employee is doing at a given moment in time. Um, there's also automated systems, the one on the bottom left. Um, this one kind of always gets me because um, if you are not typing for more than three minutes, the little thing pops up that says, hey, you're kind of quiet, are you still working? And for somebody like me who often spends time, you know, reading or thinking at my computer and not actually, you know, always typing something in, um, I think it would drive me crazy if I had one of those um, um, popping on, up on my screen every three um, minutes. Um, so in addition to the computer monitoring tools, um, many uh, employees wear badges in the workplace. Um, those can track them throughout the, the workplace and their activities. And there's now something called the sociometric badge, which uh, tracks not just location, but also um, will uh, record which employees are near other employees and whether they are engaged with one another, um, how long they converse, and, and sort of the tenor um, of the conversation. So why does all this matter? Um, well, because depending on how these algorithmic tools are designed and deployed, they create the potential for worsening inequality in the workplace. Okay, it's not picking up. Okay, um, so they create the potential for worsening inequality in the workplace. And so the first area I'm going to talk about is bias and discrimination. Um, for ease of reference, I'll mostly be referring to race and gender bias, but this could refer to any kind of protected class um, for which discrimination is something that we as a society has said is a problem. So um, I talked earlier about how employers are relying on Facebook and Google to uh, send out ads for uh, job opportunities. Um, most employers re uh, rely on these internet platforms for their recruitment process. Um, and so these platforms are playing a critical role in determining how information about job opportunities is being distributed. And there is evidence that they do not distribute this information in race and gender neutral ways. So just mentioning a couple of the studies here, 
Um, this was one done by some computer scientists where they simulated job searches by male and female users. Um, there was an ad for a highly compensated career coaching um, uh, service, and it was overwhelmingly served to male users as compared to female users. There was another study in which the researchers posted a, uh, an advertisement, um, I believe this one was on Google, um, advertising uh, STEM careers. And this one, again, predominantly was served to male rather than female users. Um, so the initial concern, um, particularly with Facebook, was that advertisers were deliberately using the targeting tools in a discriminatory way. Um, if you want to post an ad on Facebook, you could, you could specify the gender, the age, the location of your target audience. The location is often a proxy for the race because of uh, residential segregation. And so the concern was that employers were using these tools to advertise in a discriminatory way. Um, Facebook was then sued by a number of civil rights groups, and eventually those um, suits uh, were resolved through a settlement. Uh, now, what the settlement held was this. Um, Facebook agreed that it would create a special portal for housing, employment, and credit ads. Those are the areas uh, where there was particular concern about discrimination in advertising. And Facebook agreed it would create a special portal so that anyone advertising in any of these three, three areas could only post an ad by going to the special portal. And when they did so, they would not be allowed to target on a demographic basis, you know, again, like gender or age, nor could they use an attribute that is, quote, directly a direct descriptor of or semantically related to a protected class. So, for example, if the employer wanted to avoid hiring older employees, they could, you know, target young and hip, right, or millennials or something like that. And so those kinds of descriptors were removed as well. And then the location um, targeting was also limited so that it couldn't be used as a proxy uh, for race. So that was the settlement. Um, the problem is that um, it wasn't clear that it was effective. Um, researchers found that even neutrally targeted ads that went through this special HEC portal were being dist distributed in demographically skewed ways. So the reason is this. Um, the HEC portal only allows the use of um, non-demographic characteristics for targeting the audience. And the idea was it would select a, an eligible audience to receive these ads that was demographically balanced. In fact, what was happening is that eligible audience was then narrowed down by Facebook's personalization algorithm. In other words, not everybody in the eligible audience would receive the ad. Um, Facebook's personalization algorithm would determine who within the eligible audience would receive the ad. And when it did so, very often the actual audience that received the ad would be demographically biased. So um, an example of that that says new, neutral targeting, uh, biased delivery up at the top. Um, maybe I should get rid of this. So there was a uh, construction company that wanted to hire truck drivers, and they used the HEC portal. Um, happy to have anybody, male or female, um, apply for the job. And what they found was that it was overwhelmingly being served to male Facebook users, but the blue, the tall blue bar there as compared to the green, the much shorter green bars. Um, there was another case in which uh, an advocacy group in DC was trying to recruit college interns, and again, used the HEC portal, found out later that the ads were being served overwhelmingly uh, to male college students rather than female college students. So it's not what these companies or these advertisers are expecting, but Facebook's algorithm seems to be predicting interest or engagement with the ad in a way that maybe reflects uh, stereotypes uh, about who is interested um, in what. Um, okay, so these, although my focus is on the workplace, these same issues have uh, affected the housing market as well. And one of the most recent developments that's relevant to this um, was an investigation that was undertaken by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. So HUD did a study of this HEC portal, and they found that ads that were placed through it were continually uh, being served in a biased way. So for example, 
they posted two sets of paired ads, one for housing in a majority black neighborhood, one for housing in a majority white neighborhood, same socioeconomic profile otherwise. And the ads uh, the, in the first category were overwhelmingly served to black Facebook users, second category overwhelmingly to white Facebook users. So in other words, Facebook's personal, personalization algorithm was engaging in a form of racial steering, even though the advertisers themselves thought that they were targeting a neutral audience and this special portal was supposed to take care of the problem. So based on this study um, and some others, um, HUD started an enforcement action against Facebook, now Meta. Um, and this summer, um, they reached a settlement, um, at least a proposed settlement. And the, the, the terms are this, uh, Meta has agreed to create a variance reduction system, which uh, what they mean by that is they have committed to developing methods to reduce the variance between the eligible and the actual audience based on sex and race ethnicity. In other words, if it's a neutrally targeted audience, if the eligible audience is demographically balanced, the actual audience ought to be as well. And Facebook is working on a technology to ensure that its personal, personalization algorithm doesn't add um, that kind of a skew um, into the data. So um, they have until December next month to do that. And they have agreed that um, if it is approved, they will voluntarily apply this technology to employment and credit ads, as well as housing ads. So this is a promising development. Um, will, we have yet to see if they will be able to produce such a system and if it will be accepted um, by the government um, and the case will finally settle. Um, but the point here is that Facebook needed to make a specific intervention in order to prevent the biased delivery of ads. They couldn't just rely on the fact that the targeting was neutral and that they thought they had a neutral algorithm and just assume that they were gonna get demographically balanced results. So there's an intervention that was required here or is being required here in order to correct for what otherwise would be a skew in the delivery of this information that could potentially affect people's access to information about job opportunities. Um, okay, so um, in addition to places like Facebook and Google where employers may advertise, they often also rely on platforms like ZipRecruiter or Indeed, as I mentioned earlier, um, and those platforms also use algorithms. They use algorithms to nudge uh, particular candidates to apply, and then they use the algorithms to figure out who to put in front of the employer, who to feature, who to highlight, uh, and to recommend. And so we know a lot less about what's going on with these um, job platforms because the information um, is not publicly available. It's very difficult to test, but they raise a similar risk that this kind of um, uh, matching algorithm um, might produce demographically biased recommendations. Uh, the particular concern is if these platforms don't have very good information about individuals' job skills and abilities, then they may not be doing the matching on that basis. They may be matching more on things like who did the employer hire in the past or who do we think the employer is likely to like, um, which may be reflective of past patterns of discrimination or other forms of um, implicit bias. So that, that's the concern um, there. Now, uh, once candidates apply, again, um, there's a possibility that an employer is using uh, predictive algorithms to screen applicants and to decide who to actually hire among that pool. Um, again, there are risks of bias here. Um, there's a well-known example of Amazon trying to create a recruitment tool that would analyze resumes so that they could hire software developers quickly. They were scaling up at this time and needed to hire a lot of software developers. And so they tried to, to build a model that would predict who would be a great software developer and they did it by using data that they had on their current software developers who were overwhelmingly male. And so therefore the tool overwhelmingly identified male candidates and was found to do things like downgrade the applications of women if they had something like captain of the women's chess team or something on their resume that that would automatically um, downgrade them. And this was obviously problematic. Amazon realized that um, and um, junked the tool. Um, there are another number of other sort of anecdotal examples of things like this happening, 
Um, and it's not surprising, um, it's, it's well established in the literature that there are a number of different ways that these algorithms can reproduce bias. Um, it's one I mentioned earlier, if it's based on observed market behavior rather than the actual relevant skills and abilities, there may be poor data quality. Uh, the data itself may incorporate bias judgments if, for example, it includes ratings by supervisors um, who were themselves biased, those can get incorporated into the data that trains the models. Um, and because a lot of these models are simply trying to understand past patterns and reproduce them, um, they may end up reproducing patterns that reflect historical bias or occupational segregation that was common in the past. So this is the concern. Um, and it's a concern not just for individuals, the individual who's subject to one of these models and doesn't get a job, and doesn't um, have access to an opportunity, is obviously being impacted. But there's also a broader concern, uh, concern in terms of the systemic effects um, that not just on an individual level, but across populations, if these types of tools are used uncritically, they may be reproducing or amplifying um, disadvantage um, that already exists in our society. So um, what does the law have to say about all this? Um, this is very much a nutshell version. I'm happy to go deeper into the law if you would like at some point. Um, but basically, employment discrimination law um, there are, has two basic theories. One is disparate treatment, uh, which says that an employer may not take an adverse action because of an individual's race, sex, et cetera, other protected characteristic. And then there is the disparate impact theory, which says it doesn't really matter what the employer's intent or purpose is. If the employer uses a practice, even though it appears to be neutral on its face, but it disproportionately affects or disproportionately disadvantages a group like um, uh, a racial minority group or women vis-a-vis -vis men who have been underrepresented in the workplace, right? That is a problem. Um, and the employer cannot use that kind of a practice unless the employer can show that that particular practice or policy or test is one that is job related and consistent with business necessity, that it is necessary for them to screen workers effectively um, for the job. So we have a framework, um, anti-discrimination law, and as a first cut, it works pretty well. If an employer is using one of these tools, knowing that it discriminates, and is perfectly happy with that outcome, we could say that's a form of disparate treatment covered by the law. If the employer uses an algorithm that has a disparate impact, um, then the existing law says they shouldn't be allowed to use that kind of a tool, or that kind of an AI tool or analytical tool, um, unless they can meet um, this defense. So, so again, as a first cut, the framework seems to work pretty well. However, um, all of this, all of these developments with big data and AI in the workplace create some additional challenges um, for anti-discrimination law. First, there's this issue of who is responsible because now the creation of the test is increasingly separated from the employer. You have vendors who are building these tools and selling them or, or, or leasing them to the employer. Is it the vendor responsible who built the tool and made all the decisions about what, when, what goes into the model? Or is it the employer who's utilizing the tool? Um, and then, um, as we know, many of these um, algorithms, particularly ones built through machine learning, um, they're about pattern finding. They may be relying on a correlation that is completely unexplained. Sometimes the decision process, the way in which a decision is made for a particular individual may be completely opaque. So it's really hard for the employer to give a justification for why somebody was denied a job. This poses a challenge for the disparate impact framework, which asks the employer to defend by showing job relatedness and business necessity. And so one of the sort of uncertain open areas of the law is what does that mean when it's applied uh, to a, a black box algorithm? Um, there are some practical challenges as well. Um, Anti-discrimination law has traditionally relied on individuals who believe that they have been victims of discrimination to come forward and sue. Um, and that's how the primary way in which our anti-discrimination laws are enforced. Um, but these days, an applicant may not even know that the reason they were rejected is because of the operation of an algorithm. Um, 
if they do know, they are not likely to be given specific reason why their application was um, rejected. And as I said earlier, the concern is not just about the unfairness to the individual, but about systemic effects that may be reproducing patterns of discrimination. And you can't detect systemic effects unless you have systemic data. Even if you have information about your own particular case and you think something, something doesn't feel right here, you have no way of detecting if there was a disparate impact, if there was a systemic problem, unless you can get that systemic information, the systemic data. And finally, this takes a lot of uh, technical expertise and your ordinary worker is not likely to have access to that in order to be able to challenge these kinds of systems. So, so there is some law in place that can do some work that is, is, um, it is incomplete. Um, and I think um, there are certainly places where anti-discrimination law can be strengthened and clarified and that would help. But I think we also have to consider other strategies for, vet, for preventing bias and discrimination. So there's been a lot of discussion on the computer science side of things. Let's build fair models, right? We know that algorithms can be biased against historically disadvantaged groups. Let's think about how to build a fair model from the outset. Now we know that just saying we won't take race or gender into account as a teacher, that won't work because there are so many proxies for those variables in any rich data set that it, it, it's, it's insufficient, right? The same effects can be reproduced. That's what we saw with the Facebook example, right? You take race and gender off the table, you can still have very biased outcomes along race and gender lines. Um, so what that means is if we're gonna try to reduce bias by design, we're gonna to have to pay attention to those characteristics. There has to be some awareness of race or other protected characteristics and how these models are impacting those demographic groups when the model is being built. So that raises another legal question. Is consideration of race or other protected characteristics to mitigate bias itself a form of unlawful discrimination? So in other words, if model builders take race or other protected characteristics into account in order to avoid bias, have they then engaged in a form of disparate treatment? Some have begun to raise this question and to worry about it and to say maybe the answer is yes, which means there's nothing we can do about it. Um, this would, if this were true, it would create a catch-22 for employers because if they rely on a selection algorithm that has a disparate impact, they could be sued for disparate impact. If they tried to fix it by taking race into account, then maybe they could be sued for disparate treatment. So this is sort of the dilemma that a number of people have posed. So I think that that's not a real dilemma, um, and this is why. I think that there is a very important distinction between making an adverse decision against an individual based on race, gender, or other uh, characteristics on the one hand, and on the other hand, taking race or other protected characteristics into account in order to make a model more fair, in order to build a process that is a level playing field um, for everyone. So outside of the AI context, um, there are a number of employment cases that have drawn this distinction. So for example, employers are permitted to expand, to deliberately expand their recruitment pool in order to try to get a diverse group of applicants. Employers can change testing procedures if they realize that it's having a disparate impact. They can oversample underrepresented groups when they are designing tests, they can do something like ensure that interview panels are diverse in order to avoid um, implicit bias um, creeping in. In other words, anti-discrimination law does permit some forms of race conscious action when it's intended to remove arbitrary or unfair effects. Okay, so now I'm gonna acknowledge the elephant in the room, which is there is an affirm two affirmative action cases pending in front of the Supreme Court, challenging affirmative action in higher education. And somebody might be thinking everything that you're saying is going to get blown out of the water when those cases come down. Um, that is an impossible question to answer because, of course, it depends on what the court decides and, most importantly, what rationale it uses. I'm happy to talk about this more in detail later, but I actually think those cases, although they were likely to have a significant impact on higher education, that they're less likely to have an impact on what I am talking about today. Um, 
again, it depends on the court's reasoning, but um, but that those cases are so focused on that particular context, I'm not sure that they're going to have as big an impact here. So um, given this current state of law, the law, right, how does this all apply to predictive algorithms? Well, one of the things that I want to point out is that we, um, and by we, I say non-technical people, sometimes have a rather simplified model in our heads of what it means to build a piece of AI or a predictive algorithm. The idea that you take the data, you create a model, and it produces a prediction, and that's the true prediction, right? Um, so if you ask the algorithm, pick the best employee, the data scientist will be able to come up with the best answer, the best solution to that problem, the correct answer. And so from this perspective, taking fairness into account, trying to do fairness by design seems to be like some kind of a deviation from this true model or this true prediction. But I think that this picture is wrong. Um, this is just kind of a random sampling. I just went on the internet and sort of Googled, you know, like, you know, workflow for machine learning. And this is just a handful of them, right? And, and the point here is that these are really complex processes. Not like you just take one piece of data, you create a model and you're done. It's this constant multi-step iterative process. So there are many, many choices that are made in building a model. And every single one of these choices um, involves some judgment. It's not necessarily the case that there's one right way to go in terms of formulating the problem, deciding what the target variable is, how do you choose your data, and so on. Every single one of these involves multiple choices. And so if a designer in making these choices is taking into account whether or not the choice that he or she is making will have an impact on fairness when we look at things like race and gender distributional outcomes, right? That's not necessarily that they're doing something that's deviating from a true model. It's, it's just one in a series of choices that are being made to build the model. Um, so there are probably others here. Um, again, I'm not a technical person, but just immersing myself a little bit in the literature, I've come to realize it's a much more um, complex um, um, process. So what that means is there are a number of different ways race and gender could be taken into account in building models to make them more fair. Um, we might think about the selection of the target variable. Are, are we picking a target variable that has some kind of implicit bias built into it and maybe Maybe you pick something different for your target variable. Um, are there data sets that are being used representative of the population? Are there groups that are underrepresented? If so, should they be oversampled um, in building the model? Are there features that are really encoding human bias and ought to be eliminated altogether? There are lots of questions like this that go into building the model, um, and none of them should be considered vulnerable or suspect from an anti-discrimination law point of view. Um, Okay, so um, I'm gonna uh, just wanna jump ahead a little bit and, and focus on uh, or acknowledge one additional point, which is that data analytics and AI can be helpful tools in diagnosing and preventing human bias. Um, we know that humans are biased. There's lots of social science studies that have told us that for decades. Um, and so some uses of AI and predictive algorithms can help us to avoid those human biases. Um, they can help us identify where in human systems these biases are occurring and then help us to remove them. So uh, one example of that is a company called Textio that uses um, um, uh, language analysis and it helps employers identify when their job ads or their performance reviews may uh, contain ter terms that have implicit bias in them. It can kind of be a check on the employer to go back and look at this, you know, make sure there isn't implicit bias affecting um, your decision here. Um, so um, uh, so I, I don't wanna pretend that AI and um, data tools are always bad, right? And are always gonna be harmful to promoting equality, but I do think it's important to realize that there are these risks, these risks of these exacerbating human biases. The important point is that models are not magically fair and neutral just because the designers didn't intend them to be discriminatory. And in fact, they're more likely to have discriminatory effects if we just don't pay any attention to it at all, because to the extent they're reproducing patterns in the real world, the real world 
has a lot of bias in it, right? And there's a, there are a lot of ways in which um, that pre-existing bias or historical disadvantage can be reflected. Uh, so to um, talk about some takeaways then, if we're gonna prevent bias and discrimination in algorithms, um, model builders need to pay, pay attention to these issues of fairness and distributional effects. Um, the law does permit some race conscious actions that are intended to remove arbitrary or unfair bias. There are areas where the law needs to be clarified. Um, in particular, I would say, you know, the idea that a mere statistical correlation is enough to justify a model should not be enough. Um, but data science can be useful in helping us to diagnose sources of bias and to uh, develop and determine the impacts of different debiasing strategies. Okay, so one more thing to step back a little bit from the algorithm. Sometimes we get so focused on, can the algorithm discriminate? How do we debias the algorithm that we forget that the algorithm is working in a broader social context? And you can tweak the code and the data as much as you want, but if it's embedded in a workplace that is full of discrimination, it's not gonna do any good, right? So it's important to keep in mind that broader um, social context. Okay, so I also said I would talk about economic inequality. Um, and I so I'm going to just go through this really quickly. Um, so these same tools that are used to select uh, workers can also be used to manage them, can be used for surveillance and monitoring the workforce. And that poses a threat to economic equality in um, at least three different ways. It can, it can reduce the quality of work conditions, it can lower wages, and it can undermine workers' collective bargaining power. So um, worker advocates have long been concerned about monitoring tools, the impact on employee privacy and dignity. But these tools are not just being used for surveillance. The data that they collect allows the employer to restructure jobs, to break them down into the smallest possible task so that though the employer has much more control um, over the production process and can remove the discretion um, and job skill of the individual worker. So um, some employers have used this kind of uh, data to not only streamline the process, but then to impose performance um, expectations on employers and then to constantly ratchet them up. Um, there's been a lot of attention paid on Amazon. Amazon's kind of in the forefront of a lot of this and reports about Amazon workers um, feeling increased pressure in terms of the rate in which they have to produce, uh, not having time to go to the bathroom, working so hard that they're getting injured. Um, and then in some of the Amazon um, warehouses, they've been, they've been experimenting with automated management, as in if somebody doesn't make their production, they can be uh, terminated even without a human uh, intervention. Um, so th this process of sort of uh, reducing um, the discretion of the worker and increasing the employer control um, also has the effect of de-skilling many jobs. So it's not that the jobs are going away, that they're being de-skilled. Many middle-skilled jobs are being de-skilled. And so people who had those jobs are being forced to compete with lower-skilled jobs that produces a surplus of labor um, and wages have been falling. And many economists think that one of the primary effects of automation has been to increase wage inequality because of this effect of de-skilling and removing uh, the middle-skilled middle, uh, middle skilled jobs. Um, in addition to uh, these effects, there's also concerns about uh, worker bargaining power um, and their ability of workers to get together. In the past, the way workers have pushed back on declining wages and lousy working conditions is by joining together, either informally uh, to complain or by joining a union. And again, many of these uh, forms of monitoring and surveillance, digital monitoring and surveillance in the workplace um, are making that more difficult. The same tools that allow an employer to sort and select and predict who's gonna be an employee can also help them predict who might be more likely to engage in collective activity and screen them out of the workplace. Um, the tools that uh, are monitoring workers and their interactions throughout the day also are likely to have the impact of discouraging workers from engaging in uh, collective conversation um, about um, shared workplace concerns out of fear of retaliation. And they're, um, again, to, to pick on Amazon again, 
um, there was a report about Amazon at a computer program where they were trying to identify hotspots, like where where was it likely that that workers uh, were maybe about to or, or ripe for starting to talk about um, unionization. So um, what does the law have to say about this? Well, well, unlike in the discrimination context, there's very little law that has leverage on these developments. Um, the law has traditionally left questions of wages and hours and working conditions to the prerogative of the employer, except for some very minimal standards, minimum wage and, and a couple of other things. Um, and so um, what has changed really is that big data and AI are giving employers new and more powerful tools to exercise this control over workers and to have the effect of reducing their bargaining power. So is this inevitable? Is AI and um, big data inevitably going to depress working conditions and reduce wages? Um, I don't think it has to be the case, um, but I think the reason it's occurring now is because these tools are being built primarily to meet employers' interests. They're not being built to meet employees' interests or workers' interests. There's lots of ways that AI could be helpful to employees to help them avoid injury on the job, to assist with um, you know, uh, hazards in the workplace, or warn them about hazards, or regulate the pace of works to avoid um, the risk of injury. And this isn't happening because workers are not at the table, right? The decisions that are being made about how these kinds of tools should be cr uh, created, how they should be deployed in the workplace, um, it's primarily the employer's needs that are being met, and there's an imbalance in terms of the input into that process uh, from work. So um, in order for that to happen, there would likely need to be some change in the law, um, maybe better regulation in terms of minimum terms and conditions of employment. Um, there also need to be more robust mechanisms for worker voice and input into the decision, into decision ways in which employer interests can be heard um, without fear of retaliation. So um, just to wrap up here, um, these developments, these technological developments, big data and AI in the workplace, um, as Dennis said at the outset, these hold tremendous prompts in terms of increasing productivity, helping us to become more productive, creative workers. But they also pose really significant risks to workers, and particularly workers at the bottom of the skill level, uh, skill scale. Um, and so uh, at the same time that we're developing these tools, we ought to be worried about and paying attention to the ways in which they can worsen inequality on demographic basis, um, further disadvantaging, historically disadvantaged groups. Um, and also uh, we should be paying attention to the impact um, on um, economic inequality. So um, what do we need now is some kind of governance structure, some kind of institutions that will help us channel these innovations in ways that are truly beneficial to all of society not just companies and shareholders, but the workers who work in them as well. So I hope that's enough time. I'd love to hear questions. Thanks for that really interesting talk. Stay up here and me. I think it seemed like they were hearing us better if we were closer. Okay. To the computer. Um, so let me uh, invite people who are online. Oops. Oh, I see there are some questions. Okay, great. Um, let, let me pose the first kind of moderator's question. Then we'll, then we'll see if there are questions in the audience and questions online. But um, you mentioned during the talk the kind of process of showing an employment discrimination claim in the disparate impact context. So one is a disparate outcome, but then there are the defenses, right? Job related and consistent with business necessity. And so I was, you, you had mentioned, you know, it's unclear or there are questions about what it means to apply those defenses to algorithmic decision making. So I'm really interested to hear more about that. Both, you know, can you do that with technology, can you can you build the model to account for that? Or does that have to be kind of a human judgment? And how do humans fit into that process? And how do you think about those defenses in the algorithm decision-making process? Yeah, so I think that it's 
Um, so that's a really uh, interesting and important question. Um, I think it is really important that the law be clarified to make clear that job related does not mean simply there's a correlation, that somebody can show a statistical correlation between the prediction of this model and who seems to be a good employee. Because if we don't know what's inside that model, um, it, it, there, there could be proxy discrimination going on in there, right? So, so, and there's, this is an ambiguity in the law right now, but I think there ought to be a clarification in the law that that job relatedness requirement can only be met if the employer can actually articulate why certain people are being scored higher than others or being screened in or not. Now, I think the implication of that is maybe some of these completely opaque machine learning models shouldn't be used in the employment context. I think that's the implication, right? Because I think there are some models where uh, you wouldn't be able to give that explanation. Um, but um, uh, so maybe I can give an example, sort of one, a very old um, Title VII employment discrimination case. An employer said, um, well, we don't want to hire women with small children because they're more likely to take breaks from work. And the Supreme Court said, we think that's sex discrimination. Right, didn't apply the same thing to men who had small children. Right now, what if we had a model and we didn't really know there was just lots of things thrown into it, and the pattern was well, it looks like there, you know, we can sort of predict who is more likely to take breaks from employment, and we don't know why, we don't know what anything what's going into it, right? But it's quite likely if that's the target that maybe it is downgrading women of childbearing age or perhaps individuals with disabilities, because statistically, they're the ones who are most likely to take breaks or have breaks in employment. Is that a legitimate basis for making a decision? Um, I would say probably not, but at the very least, we ought to have a conversation about it. And the fact that a, a machine learning model can say, well, we don't really know why. It just seems like there's this really strong correlation. We can show you a robust statistical correlation, so that's good enough for our defense. I think the court should reject that and say, you need to be able to explain what's going on because we need to be able to interrogate what you say are the reasons or justification to determine whether we think they're valid or they're in fact a kind of a, a ruse or a proxy or a cover for some form of discrimination, even if it's a form of statistical discrimination. So that's really interesting because it kind of connects explainability of models with one discrimination. Right. You hear a lot about explainability yes. just yeah. connected to one discrimination. Um, Please raise your hand if you have a question. Yes. Go ahead. Maybe everyone can hear it and repeat it. Um, yeah. Do you know, do you think there might be an issue with third party software development, third party that properly serves the yeah, so I, I think that is, and that's sort of one of the questions I had on, you know, the sort of challenges for anti-discrimination law, right? Because uh, if one of these is challenged and the employer is the defendant, and the employer is going to say, well, you know, we don't really know. We, we bought this from the vendor. The vendor assured us that this, you know, that this, this was not discriminatory um, program. Um, that's exactly where we have this sort of uncertainty in the law about whether we can get that information from from the vendor when the vendor is forced to, to reveal it. Um, from my understanding, what's happening uh, or has been happening to some extent is vendors have been um, promising employers that they will uh, indemnify, right? If they get sued, will defend. And so I think right now it's being handled more by contract. That's because employers have a little bit of you know hesitation. These are new technologies, um, but that is certainly one of the things that um, will have to be um, sorted out. And sort of related to that, even if you don't have a third party vendor, you often have these questions in terms of trade secrecy, right? And people, you know, we don't, we don't want to show, we don't want to explain because that's our secret sauce, right? Um, and, and these are things that I think are going to have to be navigated. Um, again, this goes to the question of whether retrospective liability is the best or the only way to address these issues, or whether we also need to be thinking about more forward looking regulation. Now, in my talk, I talked mostly about initiatives within computer science that build fair 
um, their, their models. But there's also been a lot of talk about building regulatory structures that would, um, you know, vet models or conduct audits or so that there might be a, like a, a government agency that could do some of this, you know, scrutiny without having to reveal all the information to the public. That's all complicated as well, but those are some of the things that have been talked about in terms of um, governance models moving forward. I think we have time for one last question. We have one um, from our online audience, which is considering the skill level required to develop and implement these data models, what mechanisms would lead to this technology used to empower the less skilled worker? So I guess is the less skilled worker going to have the skill level needed to use these models and, 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 and technologies? And if they're not, are there any other institutions or entities that can do that on their behalf? Yeah, so, so that's a great question. And certainly the individual worker is not going to be able to take on that kind of a, uh, an effort. But um, what you could see, what we could see is unions um, or other forms of collective worker organization. There's, you know, in the gig economy space there have been some sort of um, movement in this area um, where there's an organization that represents workers' interests that could hire the expertise to figure out how to use data in a way that benefits workers, right? That's one piece of it. But the other piece of it is really just having workers at the table. Um, and, and again, that doesn't necessarily take any particular uh, technical expertise, right? If I'm, if I'm a representative of uh, workers in a warehouse factory, and I'm told that the employer is now going to institute um, a, a new process where this kind of data is going to be collected and it's going to be used in this way to evaluate everyone's performance. As a worker, I don't need to know all the fancy coding that goes behind that. I could say, as a worker, this is problematic for these reasons, right? It's ignoring the fact that there's an increased rate of injury, injury. it ignores the fact that you know not everybody's uh, work assignments necessarily follow those patterns or maybe these expectations aren't fair for everyone, whatever they are. But it's the workers who are in that, that position who, who would be able to respond even without having being able to write code themselves. Thanks. Um, please join me in uh, thanking Professor Kim for really stimulating the session. Thank you all for coming. Um, mark your calendars. Our next data points event with another great speaker is going to be January 26th. So mark your calendars. Hope we see you then. Thanks for coming out.